from the desk below. Man, I never thought I would be here for the third time in a row, man, but they say timing is everything. Man, the Word. gentleman I have in front of me right here, he's a man of many hats. <laughs> he's a father. He's a lyricist. He's a comedian. He's a podcast. There's probably a few other hats he's wearing that I... Oh, he's a real estate agent. So... No, not an agent. No? Okay, okay. okay. Just, I don't know hey, though. Just, just an investor. Oh, okay. He's an investor, but most of all, man, Poof taught this gentleman to never settle. And it really shows within his music, going back from the Tales of a Fatherless Child mixtape all the way to Soccer Dad. Man, for further introductions, I have the one and only Fat Father. What up, Joe? How you doing, sir? I'm good, man. No complaints. Man, you've been busy since last time we talked with the great reception of Ken Father. I see you launched your podcast with Miss Corona and her co-host. Yeah, Jackie B. Shout out to Jackie B. So how did that come about, Hats? Uh, man, you know what? Just years of knowing each other. You know what I'm saying? And just getting to know uh, how our personalities came together. And, and it just creates a positive energy. You know what I'm saying? Whether we agreeing with each other or disagreeing with each other, it's all genuine. So that that was one important uh, element that I felt was would be needed in order to have a successful podcast. Now, would you say like you met Corona back during the 90s, during the shelter days? Because I heard like a lot of people were in the shelter back in those days. No, I actually met Corona. Like the crazy part is we met, um, we met initially through my partner, Lovejoy. Okay. But then, uh, and this back in like high school days. You Denby know what I'm High saying? School? Denby. Um, but then after getting to know her better, we found out that we were linked in a in in a family way. You know what I'm saying? Oh. Like, like my cousin was like, "Yeah, oh, that's my sister." You know what I'm saying? So it it was kind of we found out we were even closer as far as family went. You know what I'm saying? Although even before finding that out, the vibe was always family. You know what I'm saying? So and it's even been a crazy. long time. What's even crazier is like she's your label mate too at Metal Finger Music as well. Oh yeah, yeah. She definitely part of the squad. And that's what I like to see, like how everyone's like a collective as a family. Like, yeah, you guys may be artists, but you guys put that aside because the chemistry is so good within the podcast. Like, I think I checked out like the debut. It was called That's So Gay. It was some of the things you guys had me dying on that episode. Yeah. Hey, man, one thing we try to do, um, and, and the same thing I said about Corona goes goes for my girl, Jackie B. Uh, Jackie B been around us. We all been around each other just as, just as long. You know what I'm saying? So we all got to know each other over the years, watch each other grow. You know what I'm saying? So... It's, it's all organic and genuine. Now, um, because I remember you had um, you had a podcast with um, Kanava, and there was another gentleman. It was called... Oh, uh, yeah, my partner, Joey Dagda. Yeah, whatever happened to that? Because I, I used to enjoy watching you guys on IG Live. Yeah, man, you know what? I wouldn't even say that is, is gone. It's just... Um... You know, of course, during the pandemic, man, a, a, a lot of things had to be refocused. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and everybody has, you know, individual uh, obligations when it comes to their household. You know, so like even during that, we were basically recording together, you know, although we could have easily... Um, you know, come together vir virtually, or I just feel like that podcast has another energy. When you're all together in the same room. That, you know what I'm saying? And that's probably because we started that way. Yeah. Whereas Two Queens and a Fat Guy started virtually. So it's like the, we don't even really know what the live vibe, but we still know the chemistry is going to be great. Oh, yeah. 
But you know what I'm saying? So I, I wouldn't even say that the, the shit can happen podcast is gone. Okay. I would just say that it's, you know, it still needs to be, we need to still feel our way through this whole situation. Now, was that the first time that you got into podcasting, or did you do like other ones before that? Because when I see that you going with two queens and fat guy, I'm like, wow, he really must like podcasting if he's going for the second show. Well, it's more so um, about utilizing uh, your your skill set and your talents and where you're most comfortable. That's why I'll never put myself in a box. Like I'll never say, oh, I can only do one podcast or I can only be over here. You know what I'm saying? Whatever the energy is, where whatever the creator guides me to, then I'm gonna do it. Especially if, if it's creating a platform in which I know that I can pass genuine organic information. Even if the masses don't agree with it, you know, whatever situation I'm in, I'm being organic and I'm giving you my honest self. You have a lot of people who sit around and judge and, and comment on everybody else, um, you know, uh, non-genuineness or, or them not being organic with what they're saying or presenting. I'm not gonna sit back and do that. I don't have time to worry about what the next person is doing. So what I'm gonna do is utilize my platforms to put as much organic information out there that I can. I can only be you know, concerned with what I'm doing to contribute. So I'll do 50 million podcasts <laughs> if the energy is right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because it's all about, see, I like, I like that. Instead of just being like, I'm focusing all into one. It's like utilizing it because there's so many different podcasts out there and they focus on the negative topics out there. And it's like, man, we already have enough of this on the news. Like, can we get some organic, like refreshing, uplifted energy? Yeah, but we also have to talk about like the injustices in the world too, though. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially right now, man. Um but the the one and I ain't even gonna say right now over the over the years because like my doctor said something to me that that didn't sit right with me and we kind of had some some back and forth conversation about it. Now my doctor who is an older Indian, you know what I'm saying? Um, she was like, "Well, it's better now as far as the racial injustice." and the system. And I said, no, well, how do you figure that? Yeah. She said, well, because if you look around, it's all better now. And I said, well, one thing you can't do is tell me that it's better now. The same way that I can't tell a quarterback that, hey, it didn't hurt when you got sacked because he's in the game. He has on a uniform. He's the one who's getting hit. Exactly. I can't tell him whether or not it hurts or whether or not he's still in pain from a sack that happened in the first quarter and it's the third quarter. So I just wanted her to understand that you can't tell me, a black man, that it's better for black men. I'll know before you know. Yeah, because she's so, not in the game like that. Right, so you can't notify me of that. So we definitely have to use our platforms to not just spread like um, the actual news, but we also need to speak out to our people and spread ideals and possible solutions. You know what I'm saying? Like, I do believe that at the same time, this system needs to be burnt down and restructured because people say the system is broken. No, the system is perfect. The system works fine. It's working how it was designed. It was designed to have the superior and the inferior. That's what it was, divide and conquer. That's the only way that a, a chosen few can control the masses, divide and conquer. You know what I'm saying? So in, in order for us to progress, progress and do better, this system has to be burned down. 
I agree. But at the same time, we have to we reform ourselves because as much as we know that the system is screwed up, as much as we know that the system was built against us, we also have to understand that a lot of us still was programmed by said system and still operates in a manner that the system wanted us to operate. So we have to understand that, hey, I've been programmed to look at my brother like this, Gosh. not because I feel this way, but because the system taught me to feel this way. I've seen black people get extra on guard when they drive into a black neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? And that's because some of those same um, conspiracies and ideologies about black people sometimes even resonate with us to where we get to looking at each other like the enemy. You know what I'm saying? So at the same time we're re rebuilding and fighting back, I just want us to strengthen our relationships and be be more mindful of what one another is going through, you know, and, and I'm no angel. I'm I'm no angel by far. I have my flaws. I've I've made mistakes in the past. I've misjudged people when I shouldn't have even been judging people. But the point is me becoming mindful of it and trying to figure out a solution in which I can can be more understanding before being understood when it comes to my people. Everybody doesn't operate like you operate. You know what I'm saying? And I had to realize that. Like, so that's just what I'm on, rebuilding, man. I, I, I'm just on rebuilding with, with, with my people and just however I can help, even if it's just showing love in, in one moment and hoping that it spreads throughout their day and touches anybody that they come in contact with. And when you said that too, like it's knowing that it's growth that you have within you now too, instead of like, oh, I'm just kind of brushed off to the side. Like, what can I do to help fix this? And that, that's what we call growth and maturity. Yeah. So it's great to know that, you know, to know that I'm no angel, but you acknowledge what you did in the past and you're like, I'm willing to learn from that. And that's so rare these days. Like, that's what we need more of. Yeah, definitely, man. Now, definitely. Now, taking it back now too, because a lot of my listeners, I never knew there were so much Fat Killers fans like all over in Canada. I'm like, there's no Fat Killers? They're like, hell yeah, I guess who's coming to dinner? I was like, all right, all right. So, yeah. so one of the things I was curious about too, I never asked you this um, out of the two times I talked to you now too. Coming up, were you a fan of Father MC? Yeah. Okay, because I had, I was like, I can't believe we never asked him that the entire time we talked. So, coming up, because I know you have your name is Fat Fall in the whole two T's in our last interview, but what was your ignition when you got to Fall or MC? <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, yeah. I heard Fat Fall the first before Fall or MC. I'll keep it all the way a buck with you. But you want to know something funny is, man, although it, it, it may have not been the popular choice for my for my underground hip hop fans. Father MC had one of one of his songs um was the the first song I ever performed live. Oh really? Look, I was I was about 10, 10 or 11 years old. And um it, it was a they were doing a talent show audition at the um it was like a YMCA, like recreation center. So we we called my uncle and my uncle came and took took me up there. Um, me and my little brother, may he rest in peace, my brother Sam. So Sam just wanted to audition simply because I was auditioning. <laughs> I had my father MC single with the instrumental on the other side. And then my brother was like, I need a song to sing. So he chose High Five, I Like The Way. <laughs> so um, 
we get up there, man. He gets up there. He don't know any of the words but the <laughs> hook. So I was nervous because I had to go after him. This is the first time I stood in front of complete strangers and rapped anything. You know what I'm saying? So I saw my brother up there drowning. And I just bit the bullet and went up there and start singing high five. I like the way with it. <laughs> now, just on the strength that I was helping my brother and it looked cute to the people that a seven year old and his big 11 uh, year old brother came up there to help him sing. I won the crowd over already. So next I had to perform the father MC song. And I don't know whether I killed it or not, <laughs> but I know that they were already feeling me from helping my brother. So I got the applause and the big cheer. So yeah, it's funny that you asked that because Father MC has always played a, a, a part in my memories of my journey. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Although I wouldn't listen to it today. I couldn't no. <laughs> even tell you. I couldn't even tell you how the song sounds, but I don't know. It's respect. It it was good. It was good at that time for me. Yeah, for its time, it was a vibe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, I actually never. That's kind of crazy how life works out because all these years later, it becomes bad fall. It's like right. Kind of wonder if it was if it was there in the subconscious. Yeah, exactly. Because I was fat father before I was a father. Yeah. Yeah, because I understand that you had to take care of your brothers and sisters. Um, man, I think I Well, not, not even that. Just like knowing that... Um, I think it was kind of like the name was chosen... And, and then the name was chosen for this reason, because I wanted to create my own genre of fat. You know, we discussed <laughs> that before. But at the same time, I believe that, you know, the creator puts things into motion that we may not understand or see the full picture of at the moment. And, and I'm the total opposite as far as how I father uh, my children. And, and, and even stemming back to that growth thing, there was a time where I was bitter with my father uh, for not being the father I felt he should be. But I'm only judging that by the father that I am now. And if it wasn't for him being the father that he was, would I be the father that I am? So I basically say that it, it goes back to being, you know, to understanding before being understood. And I, I'm coming to the realization that although I wanted my parents to be the perfect parents, they didn't know shit. They were children. Yeah. They were teenagers when they had me. I think back to when I was a teenager. I didn't know shit. If if my son would have been born when I was 17 or my daughter was born when I was 17 or 18, when I was 17 or 18, I had my heart set on traveling the world, being an MC. You know what I'm saying? My father may have had different things he wanted to do and my mother probably had different things she wanted to do. But the fact is, at this point, now you have a baby and now you, you, you trying to figure out how to even start being a parent yeah you don't know shit you not even you don't even know what you want to do with the rest of your life yet but you know that you're going to be a parent whatever you're doing you know what i'm saying so i'm, I'm trying to understand that more i'm trying to look at it from that aspect of things just to I don't know. It's a it's a day by day process, man. No. Just just learning, learning within self. Because I don't have children, but it's a learning process overnight. Because I'm pretty sure, like having kids, you don't just learn it overnight. Like it takes years to learn. Like sometimes eighteen years to learn. Yeah, man. And you know, like anything, with parenting, you you have to be. At some point, you have to want it. You know what I'm saying? You have 
to want it. Then it's it's like um with the want, then comes the need. You know what I'm saying? Because because if you want something then you figure out that you have to do the work in order to get it. Then you have to put the needs in play to get what you want. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to be a father. I was so excited when my wife said I'm pregnant. You know what I'm saying? Then when I saw my daughter laying there in the hospital and the nurses stopped coming in to help us change her, or, or give her the bottle, I sat there like, yo, nobody's coming to help. I need to get on top of this father shit right now from right here in this hospital. So then it became, hey, what do we need? What do they need? What do I need to make sure my family is taken care of? You know what I'm saying? So you 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 have to want it in order to 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 fully be there at its at its full you have to be willing to sacrifice everything like and and that's what soccer dad is about soccer dad is about sacrifice think about putting your child on a team you sacrifice everything from time because you have to take them to practice so regardless if you work a nine to five on Tuesday and Thursday, when you get off after working all day, you have to go home. You have to make sure they do their homework. You have to cook them something to eat. You have to pack them back in the van and you have to drive to practice. While they're practicing, whether it's rain or shine, you sit there and you cheer them on. You take notes and you tell them, hey, son, I think you should do this better next game. I think you should do that. You tell your daughter, hey, that was a great recital. I could tell you was a little off on your balance, but it was still good. You know what I'm saying? You cheer your daughter on when she get to perform in a nutcracker at the Fox Theater. You take your son, like it's, it's, it all goes hand in hand with the soccer game. You know what I'm saying? You you cheering them on and it's unconditional. You don't care how you look. You don't care how people see you. You running up and down the sideline with a sign. Somebody start heckling your child. A coach get out of line. The ref make a bad call. You like, hey, fuck you. I'll fuck you up. Yeah. Flat out. You willing to ride or die right there at the soccer field. Soccer dad represents the the soccer field of life. So, and 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 I'm out here cheering for my kids and I'm out here running up and down the sideline. I don't care how people see me. I don't care how foolish I look. As long as my kids score, as long as my kid is treated fairly by the referees, as long as my children are not bothered or he heckled by the other parents, I don't have to grab the 45 out of the town and country. And I'm cool with that because we all get to go home and enjoy our evening together. I'm like, wow. See, I, I knew there was a meaning behind soccer that, but the, the way that you just like laid it out, it takes me back to um, the second track, the collide when you're talking about uh, racing to your son's soccer game and the police pulling you over. It's like, no. And then the way that you just explain that, it's like, I think like when the people actually hear this album, they're gonna, people who have kids are really going to gravitate to it because they can relate to the, some of the topics that you are touching on this album now too. I have to know it's about this album. We're definitely going to talk about that. Yeah. So by 26, you had a stable household. So like you had family already to go, like you knew what you wanted to do. So how was that like, managing being an MC, like chasing your passion as an MC while still being a dad? Because like, did you have your first children before the fact killers up? Or was this like after the fact killers up? Um, well, the fact killers were formed in like 2002. Um, we didn't put an actual project album out until 2005. Yeah. I got married in 2004 
and had my first child in 2006. Oh, um, wow. It, it was, it was decision-making time. It was, it was basically, do I, do I put this to the side and so that I can focus on, on family and I go, you know, find myself a, a stable nine to five or, or do I, and, and this, this is, this is how fatherhood structured my life. It was like, I can go, I can fill out an application at Chrysler or Ford or any factory or work anywhere, you know, guitar center, whatever the case may be, which is, which is all good for anybody doing those things. If oh, yeah. you, you have to take care of your household. But then I sat back and I thought about all of the parents and the people out there who come home from a nine to five and they're unhappy and they're exhausted and they're unable to spend as much time with their children if they want to regardless. Yeah. And I said, well, you know what? I'm gonna follow my dream. And instead of putting my family on the back burner for my dream, I'm gonna include them in my dream. I need that so, so that's why you you see if you look at album covers, if you look at videos, um, I never lost my edge. My music is still hood. It still represents where I'm from and who I am and who I've become. But at the same time, if you look closely, you see my children grow up. If yeah. you look at album covers, you see them as babies, and then now you see them as teenagers. Yeah. Like I included them in the dream. So they are, they are definitely a very important part of the dream. They're the motivation. Now within the dream, my children both took different roads, but they, they're both positive and they're both, they both stem from my dream. So my son loves to make music. He produces, he records, he mixes, um, he plays saxophone. He loves to make music. My daughter doesn't necessarily like to make music, but she loves ballet. She loves dancing. She loves music, period. She plays the clarinet. She's an excellent student. You know what I'm saying? Both of my children are smart, honor roll students. My daughter is a very business-minded, um, very highly talented at communicating and expressing herself like she takes she took something totally different from what I was trying to show them and it still moves her in a positive direction towards that goal and at the end of the day that's all I want them to do I want them to both have a clear path to the goal line and I want them both to score you know what I'm saying so it was just important to me that I found a way to include fatherhood into my dream. So at the same time, they can see me being happy, yeah. doing what I love to do, but still taking care of them. I never had to stop being daddy to be fat father. And I never had to stop being fat father to be daddy. And you're the same person all around because if you look at those, um, put the album covers on the screen so everyone can see. If you look at these album covers in front of you, you can see like, these are like family portraits, but it's your dream that you put your art into. So that's what I like about your career. Like there's nobody else that I can think of. Like, and if there is, I probably never, there's nobody else that includes their fatherhood, their fatherhood and kids within their music the way that you do. So I think like that's something to be touched on because when most people, they kind of lose it after like, you know, division after about four or five years, but from fatherhood to soccer dad, it's always been included in your kids. So that's a man of integrity right there. Yeah. E even back before that, if you remember, I had an underground street release, uh, Father's Day. Yes. Yes, I do. My, my daughter was a newborn baby on that cover. Oh, okay. We're gonna try to find that cup and put it on there for the people. Yeah, yeah. She was a newborn baby, man. So, were you the first out of everybody in the fat killers to actually have children first? Yes. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, so the name really did fit you at the time. So when you were forming in 2002, did you meet everybody like kind of at the shelter or at Denby High School or like, did you guys know each other from the neighborhood? Because I don't think I initially asked how you guys formed. No, well, it all came about because um, my man, Chris Cobb, uh, we kind of owe it to Chris Cobb. That was, may he rest in peace. Um, he's like a big brother. I met Cobb when I was like 14, 15 through another producer. And uh, it, it was just the chemistry, the brotherhood was just there from that point on. Um, now we all had a group or it was like a collective of MCs and groups called the Teamsters that Cobb and um, my man, uh, the president created. You did your uh, debut on that one actually, didn't you? You're still uh, on Team Stuff's album. Yeah, like the first time Fat Father was heard on an actual album product for sale. Um, and now through the whole Teamster thing, we used to meet a lot of people because the idea was for it to be rap's first lyrical union, meaning you could be from any group, from any hood, whatever the case may be. If you had talent and you were like-minded like us, we wanted you to be a part of our union. We were here to fight for all uh, artists and MCs and groups or whatever. Now through that, a lot of people used to drop through Cobb's house all the time. And one day this dude walked in, it was Gordy, and he had this whole other style. And there were a few people in the room who were threatened because he was something new. It was something refreshing. It was different. It wasn't the normal blah, blah, blah. It was more so, I remember he said a line, he said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm more paranoid off smoking true gans than sitting in a raid house. It's been sitting in the crack house with two friends who swore they just spotted two blue vans. I was like, shit. So while other people were offended, I was intrigued. You know what I'm saying? So we got to kicking in and, and, and building. And it was he was a solo artist. We were all solo artists. You know what I'm saying? Even though I was within the Teamsters, I was still fat father within the Teamsters. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, yo, so he started, um, you know, he started doing shows where we was doing shows at and, you know, I started hyping them and getting on stage with them. And I used to have this saying, I used to walk around like I'm a motherfucker, I'm a fat killer, flat out. That's what I used to say, I'm a fat killer. And then my man Cobb say, man, I just met this dude named uh, Marv at this record store called Caboodles, man. He won this battle, dude, you got a meeting, man. He remind me of you. So me and Marv met outside of the Lush Lounge. And I just remember we were roasting somebody. We just, <laughs> we just, it, it was natural. The, the whole chemistry was there. We roasted somebody and we standing there talking shit. And I'm like, man, I'm a motherfucking fat killer. He like, yeah, me too. Like, <laughs> you should be the fat killers. Now from there, of course, we hollered at Gordy. He was with it. And then, uh, Cobb brought up this cat named Bango. Shimmy Bango, who was in a group called the Lab Animals. And Cobb was like, yo, we need somebody like the Shimmy Bango dude. I hadn't met him yet. So one night we at this spot called the Millennium AD and, and Obi was cool with us too, Obi Trice. But Obi Trice walked in the door. Uh, this one well-known asshole was banging. And Shimmy Bango walks in with a OB Trice uh, like CD or something in his hand and he held it to the sky. But the arrogance in his face <laughs> was like, yo, I'm a fat nigga and that's what it is. And I'm the coolest motherfucker in this room. And that just made me say like, I told Cobb like, yo, you right, bro. We need him. Like, cause at that point we'll have four fat motherfuckers who are totally cool with who they are, they are. 
and they all have different distinctive styles. Like we would have the complete package and not only are we we fat, but we're underground MCs. So it doesn't have to be a joke. Yeah. Like we actually have the skill set and, and it just, that's where it stemmed from, man. Yeah, man. See, like, I like how, like, it was so organic, too. Instead of, like, I need a bunch of fat people all together, you guys actually clicked instead of just, like, forcing it. I think that's why that first album came out so good. I used to bang that album to this day, and it's like, damn, you know, like, losing an album won't last. Like, the, the agent of, like, oh, man, I didn't really feel this at the time. But when I play, well, guess who's coming to dinner? I could play that all the way through, and it's like, like, I, I really wish more people would talk about that album in this day and age because the growth that all four of you showed, it's 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 impeccable, to be honest, because a group like that, I like to say, like, you know how Slaughterhouse did the shady thing and that album didn't really last that good? Man, yeah. I really wish Fat Killers had more albums in this, though. But I remember asking Mo that you guys don't want to mess up the legacy and that's understandable too but when you guys all rhymed together like how you did on uh veterans day i was like yo yeah. i still play that track to this day too so before we get into your uh album soccer dad too i also wanted to know that you you were very early on this underground wave you have tracks of rock marciano yeah tracks of sean price yeah multiple tracks of fat cat multiple yeah Remember the very first, when I first started getting into Detroit hip hop, there's a cat named Bishop Lamont. Mm -hmm. And I was a fan of this gentleman. I still am. And I yeah. remember when he did Hooked Up With Black Milk for Cali Trot. You're on that album. Yes, definitely. So how did that come about? That's one of my fa all time favorite features from you guys. Uh, well, you know, Black Milk was family. So uh, we used to all be in the studio together. And, and when him and Bishop Lamont and Hex Murder was putting the album together, you know, Hex, Hex always go tap on the, the MCs who he feel like fits this project. I mean, which was damn near everybody on Cal Troy. Yeah. But, yeah, that, that's all it really was. It's like, yo, I need you on this joint. I, I put a verse on it. Mar put a verse on it. Then we came back and, and, and the OG Trick Trick had laced it. Like, the rest is history, man. So you guys weren't actually in the studio with that. You guys just did the verses and sent them? No, we were all, we all worked out of the same studio. Oh, wow. Okay. But the thing was, Trick always worked at night. Oh. Trick was a night owl. So we would all be in the studio all day. And then as we all sleepy and leaving and going home, Trick is coming in hyped and ready for the night. <laughs> so when you come back in the morning or come back tomorrow, you like it was times where I had songs Trick Trick wasn't even supposed to be on. And you'd be getting on it. <laughs> and I'll just come in tomorrow to Trick like, Yo, man, check out what I laid. He's like, yeah, I'm not about to argue with that shit. It's dope as hell. Like, we we actually got, me and Trick got joints together. Now you guys do. Even on the Fall of Hurt album now, too. I think he's on there three times or two times. No, nah, you mean um, the, the Fat Father self-titled album? Yes, yes, my bad, yes. Yeah, yeah, because Trick was like executive produced that album with me. He did a lot of the beats on there. And a lot of stuff you wouldn't even, like, thanks for my child. Oh, like, he Trick, did that? Trick produced that. Oh, shit. I didn't you even know what I'm saying? Wow. That's, that's why I like, that's how I like to work with producers, though. Like, even with Foul Mouth, if you listen to the Soccer Dad album, and it's songs like Underground Ballin', it's songs like Number One, it, it, it's different vibes on there. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and think about it in the sense of, like I was saying earlier, think about that soccer game or that field. And you look around and you see the ratchet parents. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You see the calm, cool, collect, conservative parents. And then you see the parents who, hey, I I just want my kid to be happy. So I'm here standing in the rain. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you see the parent that's like, what the, what the fuck did you say to my kid? I beat your ass. When you listen to soccer dad, like you, at some point you feel all of them vibes. You do. Like, like you head, do. head shot <clears throat> is the, I fuck you up for fucking with my kids song. You know what I'm saying? It does actually, it does. The, the truth, the truth is like, you know, this is just honestly me. It ain't it ain't no bullshit. I am I love my I love my minivan. I, I love my children. This is just me. You got songs like Stick to the Script. Oh, just, I'm fire. Just just basically saying, hey, be who you're gonna be or don't be. Be who you are or don't be. Because if you're not being who you are, you're not being anyway. You know what I'm saying? It's all a facade. It's all a front. Soccer Dad, that song is just what it is. The commute just shows the urgency to get the, the commute is just showing the urgency to get my child to the goal line. Not just the game. They were in the game on their birthday. But I'm trying to get them to the goal line. You know what I'm saying? Raging Angel starts off like, hey, I'm the most loving, caring man in the world, but I can rage with the best of them if you fuck with my family. So the soccer dad is still raw, uncut, and underground, but it has deeper meaning to it. See, I like how you got into some of the tracks like that too, like like the commute, like the way that you're rhyming about going to your son's soccer game, but the way that you just explained it, he was only in the game for both. I'm just trying to get him to the goal line. But did that incident really happen? That you were speeding to Oyo's soccer game and the police pulled you over? And like, I don't make a song about this. Well, it was definitely a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you don't understand. At one, it, it would be times when, when my son plays soccer, we live like, 12, 13 miles from the soccer oh, wow. field, right? And he would have to be there at 5 30, 6 o'clock. And it was five o'clock, and I was just fixing him something to eat. And then we we trying to leave out the door at at 5 15 or 5 20. And oh. it's rush hour. Yeah. So I'm I'm in traffic. I'm trying to take back roads. Some of the mile roads don't stretch out longer than the others. So you got to basically play connect four with the <laughs> you know you trying to connect the way to get to this field. Like yeah. So I've definitely been there. The commute has definitely been a a, a real vibe. Yeah, because the way that you were going off on that i'm like he must have had to have some kind of incident like this because this you either had to live it or you're really good at telling stories yeah yeah so, so like even like the step to stick to the script you have lines like i'm gonna be around for no been around for a long time like mcdonald's fries paid a fine i was like oh damn now that's now that's a fat fat father line right there because because Everybody knows McDonald's fries never changed. Never changed. Never changed. And dig, you can drop one under the seat. And 10 years later, when you look under the seat, still the same. It's still going to look the same. I'm exactly like a McDonald's fry. Yeah. I'm I'm always fresh. It, you know what I'm saying? Like it, people when people see me they're always excited you know what i'm saying i'm not for everybody yeah and if you throw me under the seat when you look back under there 10 years i'm still gonna be looking fresh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm still i'm still gonna possess the same power that i did 10 years ago but that's the same reason i don't eat mcdonald's fries because <laughs> that shit 
if that shit don't nothing happen to it under the seat for 10 years, what is it ha- what is it doing in my system, man? <laughs> but that, that's what I like about like your intricate when it comes to the rivalry because that line suits you so well. It's like I'm I'm glad that you came up with that first because it shows like the genius too behind it too. Like it's like, dude, like if you're not into a rap like that, it'll fly over most people's head. But if you're really into it, you have appreciation for like those type of lyrics. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I love uh one of my favorite lines from the album is from Papa Free, man. Okay, well, what you want that be? When I say I don't acknowledge turkeys. Uh, I said, I don't acknowledge turkeys, basically, if they not come in with dressing. If they, <laughs> if dressing is not with the turkey, then it's not the type of turkey I want to be around. You know what I'm saying? This I mean, is fresh off the grill. This is fresh off the grill. Well done. You're now welcome to eat the message. Oh, you follow me? Yeah. I okay. So you're not welcome to eat the message after two. Yeah. <laughs> it's fresh off the grill. Well done. Like like I do my job well, and everything I spit from my grill is well done. So now you're welcome to eat the message up. Yo. <laughs> See, like when you come up with something like that, like. Is it like a spur of the moment or do you have to like actually cook to like come up with something like that? Man, I don't even realize it until it's written. Until <laughs> Listen, when I listen to beats, the beat tell me within the first few seconds whether or not it's gonna communicate with me. Of course. Like some beats I put on and they don't wanna talk to me. You got to look at it like you see a, a fine woman walking down the street. So the beat may not be an ugly beat if I don't end up rapping on it. But this particular beat entices me. You know what I'm saying? So w- when it starts talking to me and giving me that rhythm and I start laying my lines out there, you know, I'm, d- I'm just trying to put my best work out there. I'm just trying to communicate with the beat so we can have a great conversation about whatever we want to conversate about. And whoever can relate can relate. Some beats don't say shit to me. They like, man, get your fat ass out of here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like I tried to, like I love trap beats. I ain't go front. I love because I feel I I feel like trap beats are so for me it's so easy because I'm a pattern rapper you know what I'm saying if you listen to a lot of today's music that it's melodic yeah it's still it's patterns you know what I'm saying so regardless I'm a pattern rap pattern rapper but my son done put on beats for me or tried to get me to do the auto tune and it'd be like the beat be like, man, get your whack ass out of here. <laughs> like, like, like the beat, the beat be like, man, I want to hear that shit you got to say, man. Let that, let that young boy come over here and talk to me. <laughs> Cause your old ass, what you saying, I'm I'm just not feeling that. This this beat, this beat is about getting lit and turning up, and you up here <laughs> talking about family and providing for your kids. Like, boy, if you don't get your whack ass out of here with that, with that mature shit. So the beat will talk to you. <laughs> see, see i like how you brought that up now too because when i was listening to this album i i, I knew foul did trap beats i just never heard any of them and then when i heard him on this i was like oh this this one came out of left field of that one too so i like how you how you touched on upon that how you like it and it's included on this album now too because most people wouldn't even know foul would do some type of beat like this when they hear it it's like whoa 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 there's a lyricist over this and he's actually flowing and he's making sense. Not talking about getting lit. Yeah, Foul, Foul is a is a genius, man. People don't understand. Like it's it's a lot of foul hang around a lot of underground MCs who just love that soulful sample shit. So yeah. of course, a lot of times that's what you're gonna hear. You know what I'm saying? 
but like foul has some shit. It's kind of like Apollo Brown too. Like this Raheem Devon joint that he oh, did. Like yeah, when, when you first hear about it, you like, okay, what this about to sound like? Then when that shit is playing, you like, same thing with foul, man. I didn't heard some shit and I'll be like, yo. You made that? You did that? That's what I want to rap on. Gee. So, yeah. so, so getting into soccer then now too, like, because I understand, like, this was an, I, you released your first single for it um, before Ken Fowler. So, like, what was the ignition, like, approaching this with Fowl? Uh, well, initially, Soccer Dad had been done. Oh. Soccer Dad was done. Uh, like, King Father and Soccer Dad was done almost around the same time. It just wasn't sonically done. Okay. Like I had done everything that I had to do as far as rhymes, yeah. but it still needed to be, it needed the quality of the sound wasn't ready. So, you know, we, we dropped Papa Free back then just to let people know, hey, we not bullshitting, this is coming. You know what I'm saying? And then shit just changed and it went into King Father. But that's also the beauty of the game because I control the narrative with my art. You know what I'm saying? So we we basically made a, a, a call like, hey, this is what we're gonna do. This is the direction we're gonna go on. You know, in the past, people always worry about, well, how is this gonna look? Or maybe we should do it like this or it's not done like that. No, we do what the fuck we wanna do. And this middle finger to whoever don't like it. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> so, like, I, man, I never knew that soccer that was finished finish before Ken Fowler. Because I know Ken Fowler was a very personal album to you. So, like, because there's a, there's a lot of producers, like there's Blizzard, Oreo, and I'm missing a few trucks on Ken Fowler. But, like, for soccer that, this is strictly produced by Foulmouth. What I like yeah. about this, too, that it's coming right after uh him and bane's album now too and if people don't know bane bango was part of the fat kill so i like how like all of this is like intertwining with each other now too because foul mouth is a huge fat kills fan he worked with all of them but now it even cements him even more because he's got albums of you and bango man i would be surprised this guy has an album of king gordy or Murray pretty soon yeah yeah so, so when you were coming into like Foul, like how did you meet like this producer that you have such great chemistry with? Because out of all your albums, Fatherhood is probably the top for me. But Soccer Dad, that's gonna come right above the second above Kim Fowler. Man, I don't even remember how me and Foul Mouth met. <laughs> it's been that long, right? That's that's how cool we are. I just remember. Whenever we met, it was like, hey, let's work. All right, bet. So, so did you did you already know that like for soccer dad too, like this was gonna be a conceptual conceptual album based off of the title track? Was that the first track that you did for it and kind of inspired it? No, I don't I don't think none of that's I think that's one of the great things about me and who I am. Even when my project sounds conceptual, it's not conceptual because it's always life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I can go in any direction. Like it 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 doesn't matter. I can I can ball out if I want to. I could talk about not having enough money if I want to. I can talk about uh taking my daughter to a daddy daughter dance. I took I could talk about how much I love my wife. I could talk yeah. about my wife piss me off. I could talk about my kids piss me off. I could talk about, hey, I don't want to sell dope because I'm a father. I could talk about I will sell dope because I'm a father. It's it I could go any any direction I want to go because I've always given you me the organic. Um, and that's why I felt like Tupac was so real because on side A, he'll have, I get around and on side B, he'll have, keep your head up. And some people will be like, well, that's hypocritical. No, that's just real life. 
nobody yeah. feels the same at it at in at every moment and and in different times and moments and depending on where you are you may feel different according to your circumstance That's fine. And, and i'm just glad i've always left that gate open to where the only expectation that you should have of me is that i'm going to be real and i'm going to be honest you don't need to expect me to always have on a million dollars worth of jewelry. You can see me out in my pajamas and my house shoes and still be like, that's fat father being fat father. You can see me in a VIP with a $200 bottle of champagne and I'm still capping jokes and you're gonna be like, man, that's fat father being fat father. Catch you, Fats and a McLaren catching jokes. They are, that's Fat Father being Fat Father. Yeah, you see me at Kroger trying to figure out, should I get this Smart Balance butter or should I get this, you know what I'm saying? Should I Should I get this, I can't believe it's not butter. Like, it, <laughs> and, and it's still Fat Father being Fat Father. You see me at the school volunteering. You see me walking around with a group of kids that I have to chaperone at the apple orchard that's still fat father being fat father exactly you see me pistol whipping a motherfucker for uh getting out of pocket and being disrespectful and my my children in the store and he over here talking about bitch this bitch that to somebody else and not re it's always going to be me being me and that's what I like about it too. Like even like with the underground balling song now too. Like you have a line like, "Some girl wanted me to take it to new heights, but I rather head to the pad of my wife." I was like, "Yo, that's fat faller being fat faller." Yeah, definitely, man. Like, I'm I'm a man first of all, so just like the other men who be out here, it's times I done been in places where I saw a beautiful woman. And I was like, oh my God, she's fine. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, she's not my wife. Hey, your loyalty. She not she not she not gonna hold me down like that. You know what I'm saying? She she not gonna accept my my um my shiny moments and my broken moments. She she's not gonna instantly uh sit around and try to help me configure a solution to a problem before it's even a problem. You know what I'm saying? But my wife will. That's so, and, and, and it took growth to get there though, because I don't want people to think like, man, who the fuck he think he is? Is he trying to act like uh, he's perfect? No, I had to get here. This was, a, I had to get here. I had to, I had to get over certain fears. I had to conquer certain situations. I had to try to understand and evaluate who I was as a person. To this day, it's still things I say, damn, that's fucked up, that's fucked up, that's fucked up. How can I be better? How can I do better? Like this shit, so when, I, when I'm when i telling people something or I'm giving you the game, it is organic and I'm giving it to you on a real live feed. I, th I think that's why like you get as many blessings as you do. It's because that you don't shy away from who you are. Like you don't pretend to be somebody that you're not. And I think that's why a lot of people gravitate towards your artistry, but they gravitate towards you as a person because they know you're you 24 seven. There's so many, the amount of like lives, like you obviously been on major tours. But a lot of people, they would have the ego a little bit up to like, yo, I was on a major world tour. I don't have to talk to you. I'm this, that, and the third. You got to be one of the most humblest cats like we've ever known because you could easily just like, oh, I, was, I was around Big Proof. I was around Shady After. But I don't ever hear you say that. And that's that's so rare. That's so rare. So you I got to put you for that. Because, man, when for one, when I'm around my people who are genuinely like my people, like 
I don't see none of that extra shit. Yeah. When when I saw proof or when I was around proof or when I'm around conniver, like these are my brothers. Yeah, before music. The, these are like like even even if it's after music, the fact of what we became or what our relationships became, I don't see none of the accolades and the plaques and none of that. I just see the brotherhood. You know what I'm saying? Nice, I've, I've never been the person to hang around people because of what I felt I could get music wise or what I could get. You know, if it happens, it happens. If we do a song, we do a song, that's great. But we've also sat in parking lots for hours and roasted each other <laughs> just because. And it had nothing to do with music. It didn't matter how many plaques he had. I'm still going to roast uh, Proof <laughs> for his teeth. I'm still going to roast Trick Trick for his slick down hair. I'm still going to roast... Um, Whoever, man, like anybody can get it and they'll tell you like from Conniver and, and Swift and Bazaar and Royce and Deny, all these cats will tell you one thing about Fats is when he step in the room, he will roast your ass <laughs> and we're all, we going to laugh and that's what it is. So I don't never feel the need to to name drop or say I did this and I did that. Because at the end of the day, man, my most proudest moment of being me is just being me. That's how it should be, though. Like, I, I can rhyme. We know I can rhyme. When you turn on the mic and put on a beat and be like, let's rhyme, that's automatic. You know what I'm saying? But when I step in the room... I'm going to be me even when there's not a mic there. Yeah. When you turn on the mic, I'm just me rapping. Like I said, like, that's that's very rare for an artist like you to come by because it's like you, you 24-7. Like, <laughs> I could, yeah. and that's what, like, that's the best memories that could ever happen is, like, just enjoying a simple conversation of somebody roasting them. That, that memory could last lifetimes. Yeah, man, why not? As, and as long as you know, now if it's been times where I could see a person may have been having a different kind of day. The real in me go be like, all right, man, leave him alone. Leave her alone. They on a whole nother vibe right now. It's not personal. People go through shit. You know what yeah. I'm saying? That's another thing I had to also learn, you know, growing up. It's a part of growth, man. Life is a journey, man. It is. It is. Life is a journey. But 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 the lessons we learned from it though we passed down to future generations. So they yeah, learn. and that's what I like about it. Yeah. So wrapping this up now too. Um, when is Soccer Dad coming out? Uh, Soccer Dad will be out May fourteenth. Um, okay. The thing is though, um, you won't be able to go and 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 Spotify it up. Um, not saying that that won't come one day or iTunes or none of that. This is for the real, like, organic fans, man. So you have to tap into that band camp. Okay. We'll make sure you put the band camp in the bottom. You'll be able to get um, Soccer Dad on CD. You'll be able to get digital. Uh, you'll be able to order vinyl. You'll be, be able to uh, USB. Now with the USB, it's gonna have a bonus pack on there. Uh, with the oh. USB, you're gonna get the you're gonna get some instrumentals. You're gonna get some acapellas, uh, as well as you're gonna get a few of my other projects. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So the it's a, it's a cassette USB. Um, you oh, have that. Um, and we also got some pretty dope merch that that you could use when you standing out there on them fields what uh, an umbrella you have don't you oh uh, we got the soccer dad umbrella we got the soccer dad towel uh soccer dad water <laughs> bottle 
DJs. We got some soccer dad slip mats. Uh, we got a lot of this soccer dad movement is real. It's a way of life. It's a feeling. It's a vibe. It's a mood. It's an industry. It's a, not industry. It's an energy. You know what I'm saying? That it, it can touch the suburbs or the hood. That's what soccer dad is. Definitely be on the lookout. So May 14th and pre-order is going to go up um, soon. You know what I'm saying? So pre-order is going to go up probably about a little over a week before release date, just so people can actually get, we can try to get those orders um, taken care of so that you're actually listening to it on the day in whatever format you want to. See, that's crazy how you're doing the cassette USB because that, that, that changes the cassette game. Like crazy. I remember you had to put it in like the actual tape deck. Now you can just take the little USB out and put it in your computer. Like, I'm be a lookout for that one. Yeah. So before I let you go, though, um, I noticed that vinyl, vinyl is like a very near and dear object to people within music because our parents, they had vinyl, they had a track and all that. So when I see like the renaissance of vinyl coming into fruition, for all these artists and they have their voices on actual records for you having your fat uh sorry kin folder vinyl and your soccer dad vinyl i have to ask do you frame all your vinyl that you have that you put out just to be like you see dad put out a record and this day and age should teach their children the importance of vinyl yeah i do frame it but more so because i know for me uh Vinyl is very important and very near and dear to me because when I was coming up in, in the 80s and the 90s, it's like my uncle was a DJ and he had all of this vinyl. All the crates. And, and he took it so serious. Don't scratch it. Don't touch it. Don't get prints on it. And you know what I'm saying? And I would see all of these people who... I was a fan of on this vinyl and just to finally have my name and my face on vinyl like that that's why I love vinyl so much you know what I'm saying I also love the sound oh, I yeah. love that analog crisp like raspy popping like I love that feeling but I love it because it takes me back to a place it takes me back to a place when this whole ideal of me being an MC was brand new and refreshing. So that's why vinyl was near and dear to me, man. Let's and keep it, it. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and yeah, it, it also feels beautiful to be able to hand my kids a vinyl record and say, hey, hold on to this. And even have my son one and he's on it. Oh yeah, he is. Oh, he's on Ken Fall. I forgot about that. You know, so that that's pretty dope too. That he'll have that forever. Yeah, and like that that was like bring a whole inspiration too. Like knowing that you know my voice is on this record as opposed to just you know being on digital. Yeah. Wow, yeah. uh, I can't wait to see the release from Soccer Dad, man. So for the people listening, man, if you made it this far, man, I guarantee you. Go and check this man's discography. Don't even check out Fat Kills. Guess who's coming to dinner first? Go check out Fatherhood. Go check out Ken Fowler. Go check out Taylor. Go check out his Chris. Man has a Christmas album. Yeah. So, so before I let you go fast now, too, is there anything that you want to plug in? And let the people know. We're gonna put all the links for your Bandcamp and the merch in the below, so that people can actually get this for them. Okay. Uh, no, man. I'm just gonna tell people, man. Keep keep your energy positive. Keep your vibes positive. Um, spread as much love as you possibly can. Be honest with your people. Let them know what it is, how it is, when it is. Um, you know, we living in a time where we don't know who who's going to be there in the next 30 minutes because we've been losing people left and right, you know? R.I.P. DMX, R.I.P. Uh, Black Rob, 
RIP, Shock G, Fred the Godson, and the list goes on and on and on. So, yeah. I mean, just be honest, be organic, be positive, be real, show love, protect your family, be safe. That's also, that's all I want to say. And before before we let you go, though, we also we want to give people their flowers too, because when yeah. I go back and watch the DMX interview and how nori and dj fn gave him his flowers that 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 should be how media is perceived today as opposed to making all the negative headlines about artists instead of that let's give our artists these flowers so for future generations they can see that we documented them properly so that's why i wasn't gonna ask you no questions like your fat father you know eminem your fat father tell me but no nah, man this guy has a whole career without that this guy has an, an illustrious career and it's still, that's the thing that what I like about you too, is you kept what proof told you, never settled. Like your music shows that. Yeah. Yeah. So matter of fact, with that being said, man, this is another classic interview from season nine from Desk Glow, featuring the legendary, humble artist, producer, podcaster, man of many hats, Fat Father. <laughs>